Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck, pst, pst, Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea my man can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, oh, wh- why are you doing this? <laughs> You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice in. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's huh? that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen, listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Oh. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like, exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life after. <laughs> I guess even you could find it. <laughs> Hello, this is Brady Harden, and this is the ASMR episode of The Life After. Welcome to The Life After. It'd be so creepy if we did that, Chuck. I'm drinking. <laughs> you, did you like weird scratchy thingy too? Do, do, like do you like the sound of my D? <laughs> Stop. Hey, everybody, for real. This is Brady Harden, and I'm here with Chuck Parson. Uh, we are here for another great episode of season two of uh, ASMR The Life After. <laughs> That's right. Um, Chuck, I was thinking something on the way here I want to discuss with you. And, you know, I don't know if we've really gone over this, but the real reason that I don't believe in heaven and hell. Have, have we talked about this yet? Uh, n- I don't think so. It, well, especially not on the show. Um, you know why I don't believe in it? Because it would be an administrative nightmare. <laughs> All right. Think right, about okay. think about this for a minute. Follow me here. Yeah. I'm so the you. day of judgment. All right. Book of Revelation says the sea gives up its dead. The land gives up its dead. So that is all the dead people that have been alive for all right, time. Like so there's billions 7 billion billions. people uh, alive now. right now. Yeah. But now let's think of like medieval times. Right. You know, there might've been like 500 people alive then. I'm just kidding. <laughs> more than that. Five all or six, I think. But you think about the Bible people who were right in Bible, they just, they didn't know about the whole world and they didn't know about right. how long things would last. So they you were know, like, man, and aunt uh bethesda's coming back mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and they were they're stoked on that it's so stoked on that but they weren't really thinking of, on the cosmic scale right but it would make sense yeah just have one guy you know at a podium with a one single file line of people <laughs> waiting to see if their names were in a book not even a card category no 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 a book <laughs> The All book, right, the book of life, yeah, and it's it, the iPad of life now. I'm pretty sure. And we could be I, like, I check the message version. Oh well, this is in heaven. Of course, everything will work fine. One third of the angels left at one point. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, right. It was obviously an administrative nightmare. And if I was in heaven and I had to work, and I saw that big fucking line of single file humans, yeah, yeah, that half of them like been like, just, like dead in the ocean this like whole a time. Li- a little hungover from you know going to the the gray cloud and the angel orgy a few, few too many i don't know if angels have orgies man but they definitely mm. drink alcohol definitely so you're a little bit hungover and you're like ah oh, man i'm gonna be a little bit late i hope the boss isn't mad and you get there and it's fucking judgment day he's you like oh. paying attention well he wouldn't know nobody Didn't knows the, the day memo? or the hour that's true yeah that's true <laughs> they didn't send out a memo administrative nightmare and <laughs> and like think about this if people had the wrong name down or something in a similar day yeah, like a comma in it and you live in georgia and uh you're one of the black people that can't vote yeah <laughs> or you like go or, to an, i mean a dash supposed to have a dash and it doesn't uh, or you go up to an angel and you're like hey excuse me i know that my best friend should be here right. he's a really common name his name is jason jones <laughs> i'm afraid that he might have been sent to hell and then what do they do? How awkward would that be? And how much of a buzzkill Jason Jones is going to be when he gets up to heaven and is like, guys, that was really fucked up. <laughs> Let me tell you about my day. He's got, is there PTSD in heaven? <laughs> there is now with Jason Jones. I feel like this, I feel like we're, we're like just like reenacting a season of the good place. 
<laughs> I love that show. It's hilarious. It's it it it, ta- it 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 legitimately tackles a lot of the like logistical issues of of like the concept of an afterlife that you don't really think about. Very like much. which like what things can you think of? Oh, um, well, for one, like um, like <laughs> like if if you being like a good or bad person matters, which I guess a lot of Christians would argue that that's not part of the issue but like what like like specific moral decisions that you made that Mm -hmm. you thought were like good decisions that are bad like chidi comes to mind who like dedicated his entire life to being an ethics professor he's studied ethics he wants to be an ethical person to the point where he has like severe ocd about it yes he can't make a decision or anything he gets sent to hell because he was fucking annoying (laughs) <laughs> you know like in like, <laughs> Cheedy's like, defense yeah. he recently took his shirt off and I was like damn Cheedy he did take his shirt I off get and it. it was yeah and uh, all the oddly ripped jokes that they make on that show made a lot of sense all of a yes uh, anyway so uh, yeah no heaven and hell administrative nightmare not, not I'm possible not, not possible. possible not possible and who wrote that book and why is it being written in lamb's blood that's weird yeah, it's a lot of lambs, man. <gasps> well, just maybe it's just one, one lamb. It is Jesus. Is it in his? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's just like the book of the lamb. He's you know just, what's weird is too is that the the book of life was like, written before. Your, your purpose in life is for your marrow to produce blood, so we can write this book. <laughs> Good boy. And, you know, it's weird too that the lamb's book of life was written before the foundations of the world. Like as a Christian, right, you know, I right, would right. use that as you right, know, Calvin. yeah, not to surprise you. I use that verse uh, to defend Calvinism, but now it's kind of weird because there's no plan B. Well, and that like hell was plan A for God. Yeah. Was, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like to have that book and everything <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and have redemption was plan A. And so that whole thing where we'd used to say like, have like hell Brady, was just well, because meant he for the demons. does not mean that he predestined <laughs> it. <laughs> he looked down the hallway of time and he saw my name. God, I hate this. No, but just like this idea though, that like, uh, a lot of people try to get God off the hook and they're like, no, well, hell was made for, for the demons that rebelled because there's a verse that says that. And they try to make it sound like, uh, hell wasn't intended for people to burn. But then he was like, man, we got way too many people in this line. He's like, oh man, whoever made these rules that I'm having to follow really spoiled my plans. Before, uh, uh, without the law, there's no death. So, Mm. um, yeah, or no sin or something like that. So without so the shedding he, of blood, there is no redemption. No, 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 no. Remission. There's, no, there's a there's a verse that says without, but the, without the law, there's no death or sin or something. Oh, okay. Like that. And that's so what we got basic, to do. The implication is that before the Mosaic law was written, there was no punishment for being a shitty person or something. So and really, animals it's a weren't weird... eating nothing. Yeah, they weren't eating each other, right? What? I don't know, man. What? You know, what you without uh, without death, you know oh, what I'm saying? Death, like before, yeah. an, like yeah, before yeah. Adam it sinned. Might be, it might be sin. Uh, either way, anyway. it's it's a really weird. So th- what I'm saying is that um, is that if the the Bible was you, you <laughs> what can, am I trying to say? You can, <laughs> if that hell if hell was made for demons originally, and then mm-hmm. God was like, man, there's too many people. I should write a law that they can fuck up <laughs> so that I can. I don't know where heaven, to put these people. Heaven can be a little bit less crowded. <laughs> like, it was basically mass layoffs. One one third of the <laughs> angels left, and then like he had some yeah. people move in, and he's like, "Oh, there's too many people now." Yeah. And then like he had to build like a ghetto or something. Yeah, it's, it's basically yeah, outside it's the, the walls. It's the ghetto of the of heaven. <laughs> That's where I would have ended up anyway. Somebody call Robin Williams. Anyway. Uh, Wait, why Robin Williams? I didn't get that joke. Because of a Good Morning Vietnam. No, not Good Morning Vietnam. The one where he's the, uh, he has the radio show in the ghetto that's illegal. Am I getting two Robin Williams <laughs> movies mixed up? I think no, I am. You think, oh, you meant Robin Williams. You said Tim Robbins, I thought. No, I said Robin Williams. Okay, Robin what? Williams. I don't know where I got that then. That's why I heard wrong. But no, Robin Williams, that was um the the the, the one that looked like art, where it looked like a painting, right? And no, he goes no, in the afterlife to find his wife not... that died. <laughs> yes, all three of those together. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... Well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, this is 
This is Brady Harden, and I'm here with Chuck Parsons. <laughs> this is we're the, about this is the to best worst segment we've ever done. That's right. Uh, we're about to bring on our new friend Doug Demick. He is going to talk to us about his life as uh, working with Bible translating and how listening to the Bible got him to stop believing in it. And by listening, I mean um, audio audio tapes, audio cassette tapes. Oh yeah, everyone. Yeah, D- <laughs> Doug's up there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I kid. We, yeah. Anyway, but um, we're going to bring Doug on. And one of the things that, that Doug stopped believing in first was uh, heaven and hell. And, uh, or, or hell, I guess I should yeah. say. And um, yeah, I want to see where he found that inconsistency and what made him kind of walk away from the faith from that. Cool. Oh, be good. We'll be right back right after this. <laughs> After. No, after. Uh, <clears throat> we had to look up some INDB stuff we before we get to our interview with Okay, so with the movie Doug. I was thinking of was, was Jacob the Liar, which apparently is a lesser known Never Robin even heard Williams of it, film, and I but love it's Robin real. Williams. And he, uh, he has a radio show in the ghetto where he tries to give uh, hope to people. Uh, that they're going to get out so that they keep surviving. It's, and I, I was thinking of What Dreams May Come. What where, Dreams May Come. Uh, we watched my art class a lot uh, but in, yeah. in oh, high school. You? There's a few things were we did you, in my art class. We did uh, that were movie. Were you like really, were you, as a Christian, were you really upset that you had to watch that movie? No, I loved it. Did you? Yeah. I it liked the so, ending of Lost so when I was a Christian. It's incorrect. Even. I know. But I even liked the ending of Lost. I wasn't allowed to was, watch it. <laughs> or lost? Pleasantville. No, not Lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> what dreams may come. Gotcha. Uh, but we hmm. instead we both went to Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> anyway, uh, we want to welcome our guest, Doug. Uh, Doug, say hello Other to Other Robin our... Williams movies include Aladdin. <laughs> I'm just, okay, sorry. I'm done. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Hey, Doug. Hey, um doug where did you start off what was your um early introduction to christianity and the faith so i was born in peoria illinois and uh in peoria my parents went to a church called the grace presbyterian church now it was presbyterian but it was really conservative it was allied with moody bible institute and dallas theological seminary dispensationalism And left behind rapture, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. So I was. But they, they would have been preterist, that, right? Sorry? I mean. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm going to start a theological debate that's totally irrelevant. Continue. <laughs> God. I used to be really up for those theological debates. I, I love. I know. So did I. And then I just hated myself for bringing it up. <laughs> Pre- Wait, it was pre trib or post trib? That was it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was, yep. I was an amillennialist. Oh, boy. I know. We were, we're really cute. pretentious. Yeah, you were super, oh, God, super you were elite. So liberal, Brady. <laughs> I, that's the first time I've ever been told that. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I grew up in uh, Grace church and my parents uh, took me there from an early age and we were there at least every Sunday morning, sometimes on Sunday nights um, and uh, sometimes on Wednesdays. And it was a very fire and brimstony Old Testament kind of a place. You know, all of your righteousness Mm. is as filthy rags. um, And, you know, all the Old Testament stories about the... uh, people who got it wrong and God zapped them for whatever reason. If you don't witness to your friends, it's going to, you know, God told the prophet here, he said, well, listen, if you warn the children of Israel about their sins, then you're off the hook. But if you don't warn Mm. them, then you're going to get the same punishment they got. Oh, right. Oh, my God. Usually you don't think of Presbyterians being that, like, strict about evangelism. No, absolutely not. This was a very unusual Presbyterian. You really, you could have said it's more Baptist than Presbyterian in in tone, you know, in tone. We did sprinkle people, but in in tone, it was more of a a Baptist-style 
church. Sure. Okay. And uh, okay. very anti-charismatic. Um, mm. We sort of maybe thought the Catholics might have a few things right, but uh, basically they were probably going to hell, you know. Uh, right, right, right. And, and so anyway, um, I was raised in this church and youth group, youth choir. Um, I remember a time, and, and it's all the typical things of where three years old, I go forward to receive Jesus as my savior and age five, I'm riding my bike and I'm just worried about the rapture and I stop riding my mm-hmm. bike and I ask Jesus into my heart again. And oh, yeah, you know, that's, that's such a running theme. I'm with the show. It keeps coming up more and more is this, uh, Im- impulsively compulsively rededicating your life. Yes. Uh, is like, and I, I definitely did that. I think I would say most of us probably did. I did a couple. I was baptized twice, and then I don't know how many okay. times I rededicated my life, but that was yeah, a pretty Thousands, often thing. probably, quietly in your mind, right? But, I mean, the same thing, Doug, like you, you were saying, it was just that weird fear that you weren't... Because you... I was reading this in um, Leaving the Fold, uh, Dr. Marlene Winnell's book, and it talked about how you have all these standards, but you don't really know exactly what that standard is because every religious group and every interpretation of the Bible is a little bit different. So really the only way you would know if you're being a strict enough Christian for salvation is um, once you die, but then we'll find out. Oh, right. 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 That's a little late administrative nightmare. And (laughs) and what's the unpardonable sin? I mean, you got that out there too. Right. Right. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Whatever that is, you might do it or have done it. So anyway, you're, you're pretty, I think I did. I think I'm doing it right now. I think you guys have done it like 500 times. (laughs) (laughs) On tape. (laughs) God's going to just play back. He's going to play back our podcast. The life after. And it's going to be, that's what our hell is going to be, is just listening to it over and over and over. And over. Un- the unedited versions. Yeah, the ones, the ones where, where, Only my where track. we inadvertently make like really terrible off-color jokes or something. Oh, yeah. So, Doug, tell me about your rapture anxiety. Where'd that come from? What is it? What's that like? I've heard that, we've, we've heard that term before, but I don't think we've talked about it specifically on the show yet. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if I kind of put myself back in the frame of mind of a, a little child. And, and, uh, I don't think I had it super, super traumatic, but basically you're worried that your parents are going to be taken and you're going to be left. And, you know, not only are you left to face whatever kind of tribulation things might be happening, but, but you don't have your parents, you know what, you're five, six, 10 years old, you don't have your parents. So it's, um, it's pretty freaky. Yeah. And you didn't have like the Home Alone movie to look up to and strive for <laughs> at that point, right? I, I mean like he had Batman. What culture culturally, I can't that's, that's a hard word for me to say. Uh, was kind of going on at that time. Was there anything that was encouraging that rapture anxiety? The reason I ask is because um you know when I was a teenager the left behind books came out. I read all of the adult version and the kids versions. And I think that really built up my rapture anxiety and kind of built that, um, that whole culture and mindset. Did I tell you Tim LaHaye came to my church once? Yeah. Ugh. Um, Woo. what kind of stuff that was around when, when you were a kid was, was that even present? We had things like, um, movies that um new year's in the night new year's eve when we went we went to church for new year's eve and they would show right movies and some of them i remember were movies about um the rapture and oh god you know yeah. people getting left behind so i mean that's on a big screen a huge screen up in front of a big auditorium you know so you're really in the experience yeah wow yeah I remember seeing one of those uh, kind of like the earlier ones that they made in the seventies and everything. And it, that's where I, was it a thief in the night? It might've been, oh, yeah. is that one where they like died that's and they the have television ones. screens and they were able to see their lives? Ooh, I don't know. That one might've been the eighties actually, the one I'm thinking mm, yeah, of, sounds... but there was some really bizarre one. And it just kind of like, um, another thing that came up was the whole dramas that they would do on stage of like uh heaven and hell and letters from heaven and hell i think was what it was called during the yeah some conferences and stuff that i went to and the whole thing was just to kind of like 
give you that feeling that you could die or be raptured at any moment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that man, that sticks. I with remember. You. I remember as a as a grade school age kid being like scared that the rapture would happen. That, mm. or like that the tribulation would come and there's always you know i mean christians disagree about when whether the tribulation starts before mid or after the rapture yeah, right yeah, yeah, even yeah. though the rapture is like a probably not even a hundred year old you know doctrine mm-hmm. and uh, yeah it it, uh, it freaked me out a lot and there was a, a while where my family kind of got sucked into the left behind craze um yeah. I, I, not so much the book well i had the i had the kids version of the books and we had like four or five different end times movies. So I was just like, get, I was just like immersed in that culture. And it, it legitimately, yeah, it totally scared me. I was afraid. I, I, I wasn't necessarily afraid of like being left behind because that my church or whatever I believed, you know, seemed to affirm that I would be safe. But yeah. the, still the whole concept of a tribulation or a rapture you know scared the shit out of me as a kid for sure so bizarre anyway i think i was actually more scared about witnessing to my uh classmates than i was about about the rapture you know but those stories like i was saying about how if you warn the sinner then you're off the hook but if you don't warn the sinner then their blood is on your hands blah 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 um right you know and uh and so I was a shy kid anyway, and yeah. to to think about trying to witness to my school, I just didn't do it. But yeah. all the time, I was feeling like I should be doing it. And I, I guess I can remember one time I tried to witness to one kid in grade school. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, the uh, it I think it stifled my relationships with people because it mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. made me inhibited. Even more mm-hmm. than I already was, right? Because you're always, you always, when you have that mentality, you're always looking for like an in, or you're trying to justify the relationship, right? Because you're I, either you're not witnessing, and you're trying to justify why am I friends with this non-Christian? Uh, yes, if I'm not going to witness to them, or you are constantly looking for an opportunity to be like Jesus oh, juking. You're sad today. Well, I know Jesus somebody wept, that, let me tell you about my I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know somebody that loves you unconditionally and will make you happy forever and ever. Yeah. Have you accepted Jesus into your heart? So yeah. And not it does stifle relationships. And not only that, but you are there's a distance between you and the folks because you don't feel like you can be good friends with somebody that you don't know is a believer. Um Right. Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you hold yourself apart. And we also are brought up to have that fear of non-Christians. Like we have very prejudiced, like insanely prejudiced views of about non-Christians and about who they are and what, you know, that they're going to bring us down that they're sinners, you know, they don't have a conscience and all this. And there's just like this dehumanization that kind of puts that wall up there too, in my experience. Right. Yes. So did you, um, did you stay in the Presbyterian church, like through high school, through college, where did, where did you head from, from your tumultuous grade school days? So I, um, I went to Wheaton college and, um, I went there even though I had a full ride scholarship to Northern Illinois, but I, Mm -hmm. I could not, I couldn't stand the idea of going to a secular school where they would teach me more of that fucking evolution stuff. Um, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Enough of that. And, uh, and so I, I went to Wheaton, and, um, but Wheaton started to broaden me out a little bit. Wheaton was a little broader than my, um, my church was. And so I, they had Catholics speak to us in class, and I was like, gosh, they seem to be human beings. They mm. seem to be decent human beings. Okay. Hmm. And I made some charismatic friends and, you know, they were actually uh, more joyful than most of the people I knew. So, Mm -hmm. um, so I began to be broadened out at, at Wheaton. Um, So graduated from Wheaton, knocked around uh, for a few years doing this and that, and then ended up, you know, joining the mission, uh, the Wycliffe Bible translators. Wycliffe Bible translators. Yeah. 
Um, the, the the heavy hitters. <laughs> they're on the cutting edge. They're out there, man. They're <laughs> bringing like... the they're bringing gospel truth to to indigenous peoples all over the world. Are you reading brochures when I'm not looking at you? What are you doing? <laughs> Guys, I need help. Chuck is reading. <laughs> if I like pull your bed up, is it like underneath the mattress? It's just gonna be like all Bible Wycliffe like brochures and focus on the families. Like, oh, you weren't supposed to see those. No, it's just gonna be like a like a beautiful mind style like like <laughs> like me trying to translate the Bible into some obscure form of Hindi. Oh, uh, I was gonna Vulcan. Seriously, try it. No, I'm Look. not gonna touch your bed. Um, <laughs> How are you being shy though and going to Moody where everybody is like different than you are and then going to No, you mean Wheaton? Uh yeah, what did I say? You said Moody. Moody, I'm I sorry. Mean... Um Wheaton and then from there to you know, the Bible translated where it's it's gonna have a lot of different cultures, I'm assuming, represented. Uh, as a shy person, how hard was that for you? Did you have any struggles with it? Well, yeah, I had a lot of struggles with um cross-cultural stress when we were overseas. Um, but specifically, Bible translation was picked because I was a shy person. I wouldn't have to actually witness to people. Uh, because right. the idea was that um, you translate the Bible and it's like lighting a fire. And right, right, it's right. just, it just uh, people just convert when you translate yeah, yeah. the Bible. They, and so you didn't really have to witness. And that was cool because I wasn't good at that. I like that because, you know, earlier you were saying that you guys had such an emphasis on spreading the gospel and then you weren't comfortable doing it because you were shy. So you kind of found like an administrative, I don't know why I keep on using that word today, but you kind of found like a side role to do that, to kind of like do what you felt you needed to do while also holding on to your personality and being shy. Yes, absolutely. Because we've got this huge responsibility on our shoulders. These people are going to hell. And mm. if I'm not articulate or, or brave enough to talk to them, I got to do something. So is that, is that what, is that what drew you to translation? Was there, was there an experience you had or, uh, or any like particular encounter or anything that made you think, Oh, I need, I should be a Bible translator. Well, it was promoted very heavily at our church, and, uh, and, and I thought that of all the things that there was out there to do, it probably fit my personality the best. So that was sure. the main thing. How long were you with, uh, I, I always say this wrong, White, Whitecliffe, Whitecliffe, Whitecliffe? We say Wycliffe. Um, some, Wycliffe, yeah. okay. But uh, we were with Wycliffe for 17 years, or Wycliffe. 17. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was, we were from about age 30 to 47, somewhere like that, something like that. Sorry, now, prime years. you were initially, you were trying, you were initially trying to actually uh, live overseas, um, like kind of, kind of rough it, kind of be on the front lines and jump in, but that didn't, that didn't work out, right? Yeah. What happened is that early in our training, we went to what they called jungle camp or field training course. And the main thing they try to do during that course is stress you out and see how you take it. And we went into the final interview for that course, and and um, we said to the uh, director that we wondered if we were cut out for translation roles uh, because it's pretty tough for us. We thought he would say, "Well, everybody feels that way, um, you know, just go right ahead." But actually, he said, um, "You know, the staff was wondering the same thing about you folks." So our world comes crashing down. We had. Mm. We had this dream that we were going to translate the Bible into a language. And, um, but we said, well, we still want to help out. Um, what else can we do? And we ended up being in support roles. The missionaries are in Wycliffe are divided more or less half and half into translators. And then those who support the translation, whether it might be airplane pilots or teachers, or in my case, a computer person, or you know, my wife's case, a librarian, buyer, just different things you can do to support. And everybody, whether you're a supporter, or you're a translator, you're a member of the faith mission uh, in that you raise support with your friends and churches and family. Okay. And we should probably, yeah, uh, we, we kept on saying we, but we forgot to mention that you're married. Um, <laughs> when, when did you meet your wife? Did you meet her in college or? 
I did. I did meet her in college. Yeah, we met my senior year in college, got married uh, right afterwards. I was at that time planning to be a pastor and uh, took a brief stint as a youth pastor. Didn't do too well at that. Uh, so decided to go to seminary, went to seminary. Did you kill a teenager? Is that what that means? <laughs> I, no, I was a, a youth pastor. I killed him. three. I killed three teenagers. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Cheers. They're all okay now. <laughs> did, did you did you raise them from the dead, Brady? <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Resurrection spell. Uh, you yeah. Many were converted on that day. Many were converted. Kill them all and let God sort them out, that sort of thing. Oh. <laughs> It's a good way to handle teenagers. The youths. <laughs> Sorry if there's any teenagers listening. Yeah, right. I'm just kidding. You guys are great. No, <clears throat> no it was it was more me. Years. I was I was pretty immature and not used to kind of working under authority. And anyway, uh, that that didn't uh, that didn't last too long. But then I went to seminary because that's my original plan anyway. And um, in seminary, I came to the conclusion that a pastor had to do more and stand up in the pulpit and preach. Mm -hmm. And the other things that he had to do or she had to do, uh, at that time it wasn't she, but anyway, the other things that the pastor <laughs> had to do were things I didn't want to do, like right. you know, counsel and marry and have meetings and committees and things like that. So so you, so you went to s seminary. Where'd you go to seminary? Aha, two seminaries. Two seminaries. Yes, the aggregate. It's a trick question. The aggregate time was less than a full year, but uh, okay. The first seminary was Princeton Theological Divinity okay. School, um, you know, with Princeton University, and and um, I went there thinking I could probably. It was Presbyterian, you know. Yeah. But I was way, 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 way conservative for Princeton, and I went there thinking I could probably change them you know and that didn't work uh yeah um lofty goal well you know it's the savior <laughs> complex yeah oh, for sure and uh so then we went back to illinois and i went to trinity evangelical divinity school in deerfield Ooh. Uh -huh. for about a quarter but by that time not only was i married but we had a child financially things were tough and then i figured out that a pastor has to do all these other things that i didn't want to do so, so I left seminary. Yeah, and I hate that they they waited till your second seminary to tell you that. You know, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, everything's about preaching. Then they finally like have a, a class, and you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah, that's true. Here's how you do. They make sure you get you pay up first, and then they tell you how <laughs> shitty of a job it actually is. Did um, what were the what were the requirements to work for Whitecliffe? Like, I know that. When I was a Southern Baptist, to even be a missionary within our like Southern Baptist Association, um, there were so many like things you had to jump through and do, and your uh, education had to be at a certain level on a certain field, et cetera. What was that like there? We had to um, adhere to a certain doctrinal statement, you know, the, like the 12 point, you know, you guys know what those are. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think we had to have a college degree. Um, but once you got in and you know, of course you had to kind of prove that you were spiritual, once you got in, um, you took training. If you were going to be a translator, you took linguistic training through Wycliffe. So you didn't have to have specialized training coming in. It was just mainly, um, can you prove that you toe the line doctrinally um, that you've been converted, you have an experience that, um, you know, you have a college degree. Uh, and that was mainly it. So before we go on our break, what started to make you walk away from the faith? I mean, here you are, married kid, missionary, helping people translate the Bible. This kind of sounds like something you've been planning for since you were a Christian kid. And then what is it that kicked you off the island? It was a long process, but it all started off with an experience I had soon after we joined the mission, I would say about two years into the mission. Um, I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I was part of a small group fellowship that we sat around and played guitars and sang 
the charismatic praise songs of the 70s. And, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, it was the be- beautiful spirit would fill the room. And um, I was thinking, well, if that's good, then baptism of the spirit sounds even better. So I was seeking, and I'll tell you that experience after the break. Ah. Oh, <laughs> Whoa. Doug and storytelling. Leave us on a cliffhanger. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where you Stop. Would... Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Now, uh, uh, we're back. This is pretty hard. <laughs> um, right before we left, I, I was speaking in tongues, and we now have a translation. Chuck, go ahead, give the translation. Um, it was uh, 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 the patriarchy is burning. Uh, the gays will rise. Yep, yeah. that's what I said. It was a prophecy. It was a prophecy. Um, <laughs> some something to look forward to. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, welcome, welcome back, uh, Doug. You left us on a on a cliffhanger, on a what cliffhanger? <laughs> oh, oh no! <laughs> and that's it for today, folks. <laughs> oh no! And this is not a segue into abortion. All right, we're leaving that alone. <laughs> um, but anyway, so um, yeah, so I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't really care if I spoke in tongues or not. That seemed weird, but I kind of wanted an extra dose of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this was going on for several weeks, and one day I was alone, home alone, in uh, my living room listening to Christian music and um, lying on my back and living room. And I don't know, this just waves of bliss started coming over me. And um, it was like ocean waves, but really gentle and really wonderful. And in the middle of this, I sort of heard this voice. I don't know, you know how it is. I mean, it wasn't a real voice, but what I heard was, Doug, you don't have to be anything other than what you are. Hmm. And so I thought about that. After this experience, I thought about that. I thought, you know, that doesn't sound very biblical to me. Um, Hmm. I don't remember any. In fact, the Bible verses that I've been taught in school were mainly telling me I can't be myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there's absolutely nothing good about me whatsoever. um, And that the only thing that can make me worthwhile at all is Jesus, but I can't trust my own feelings, my own emotions. So this, this message wow. that um, says, Doug, you don't have to be anything other than what you are. Well, I took it to heart, even though some of my friends were saying, I don't know, it might be the devil, but I took it to heart and um, I started to put it in practice. And one of the first things was, oh gosh, if I get to be myself, then I don't believe in hell because mm. there no good God would do hell. And if I get to have my own opinion about this, mm. then uh, that's my opinion. And I don't believe in hell. And mm. so, um, but it took a long time for the whole thing to unravel. Here we were in the mission, uh, supported by our friends and, and family and everybody in my family is an evangelical Christian. Everybody in my wife's family is an evangelical Christian. Um, but so it, it, yeah, that was the beginning. What about hell was such an automatic, was that something that you didn't want to have to believe in before? And just once you had that opportunity, it's like, like cut it off or what was kind of your thinking or your rationale behind that? You know, I was thinking hell would be an administrative nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. Those are wise words. Wise words. Mm. No, it's just cruel and unusual punishment. It's overblown. It's overdone. It's like, what could I have done in one lifetime of um, little 
things, inconsequential bad things. Maybe I snipe at somebody or, you know, uh, maybe I'm nasty once in a while. What, what if I stole somebody's candy bar? I don't know. What if I stole their car? Um, what if I killed somebody? Is that worth punishment? Hmm. No, the punishment does not fit the crime. That's a very good point. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, if, to, to that point also, it seems to me that if we are acceptable as we are, if Doug is acceptable as Doug is, then there, yeah, there can't be, a, you, <laughs> that, that negates the need for punishment, right? Because yeah. you are who you are. So there's no, there's no need for salvation in that scenario. And this whole idea of like Jesus dying on the cross for a few hours, um, you know, it's like, what a wuss. <laughs> yeah. Because it just <laughs> right. literally anybody else is going to be burning in hell forever. You know, yeah, like yeah. there's no comparison he, between he a couple dipped into hours. hell for like 24 hours or whatever. Oh, but, no, that's oh, but, we took that back. That That's what the early saints believe. He, took we on, took, he propitiated the wrath of God, you Calvinist. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Propitiation. But but I'm saying it's like we, we have such an emphasis on, oh, my God, you know, he sacrificed. He did so much for us and how much pain and how horrible crucifixion it is and everything. But really, just any average Joe, your great grandma who didn't hear the gospel, who's burning in hell is already gone through more suffering than him just last right, week. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't, I heard Don't a, even get some, me started. There was a I think it was a deconstructed minister or it might have been a it might have been a Christian. I heard him say that the he basically said the biggest place where I lose Jesus is that his ministry only lasted three years. Basically saying like he like he was mm. he's been in ministry for however many years and it's fucking hard and terrible. Yeah. And Jesus only had to do it for three years. That's <laughs> such a good <laughs> point. Do, wow. he deuced out. So, but I'm gonna throw my deuces up. I should auto tune that in the final version. Please so. do. Uh, but Doug, like you started questioning how like two years into your. 17 years of Wycliffe as a missionary like um you're you're kind of a bad missionary <laughs> if you didn't believe in hell well what 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 I what I am is a bad deconverter that it took me that long to actually unravel the whole thing but, <laughs> it takes a um, long time man. it does it take a, a long, long time. time yeah it's such a tight web that they weave you you take oh yeah one only take out one strand. And, and I have to say I was doubting hell, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I wouldn't have said back then, Oh, for sure. I don't believe in it. I was doubting hell. But sure. even if you take out that one strand, there's so many other strands in the web that you were caught in, right. That it takes you a long time mm -hmm. to unravel those strands. Absolutely. Did you have anybody that you were able to talk to or kind of bounce some of these ideas off of during this time? No, I really didn't. There wasn't anybody that I knew of in the mission that was having the same kind of doubts. And of course, when you go home to your supporting churches, you're not going to be talking about your doubts as yeah. a missionary mm. over there. So I didn't. I didn't have anyone. Well, and also that's your, I mean, your, that's your livelihood. That's the thing. A lot of people just get hung up in it, you know. Because mm. it's like, way. You, I mean, you, you got to get a new job too. You know? Yeah, it's a huge. That's a, a big lot thing. of ones, it's right? a big thing. And I kept thinking that I was going to find the way that it all fit together. Sure. You know, you're told you're told as a child that it all hangs together. There are no contradictions. Um, it all the Bible just agrees with itself. And um, I kept thinking I was going to find that. So I tried different religions. Even when we were in the mission, I looked into some, um, I think, Seventh-day Adventists and just different things to try to see if there was anybody that could fit it together. So, I mean, when you said different religions, just like different denominations within... Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, not religion, religions, but different denominations of Christianity. That makes so, sense. Uh, so, during that time, you spent a lot of time listening, reading, translating the Bible, or, you know, participating in the translation of the Bible. Um, and you started to develop doubts just from that process, right? I mean, the... it wasn't actually from participating in the translation, but because okay. I didn't do too much of that, but um, it was from what I did in my spare time 
So I had this uh, cassette, and I really was never good at keeping a quiet time. It wasn't my thing. Um, but uh, getting up in the morning actually wasn't my thing. But mm-hmm. um, heard that I figured, well, I'll get these. Yes, they were cassette tapes. Yes, I'm <laughs> old. Yeah, I had the Bible on um, cassette. We uh, we don't need. I'm, if that makes you old, I'm old. <laughs> All right, Brady. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you guys are so old. I had at least had a I at least had a CD Walkman. Good grief. When you were born? Yes. That's n- that's not true. I know. <laughs> it's a lie. Lying about your age, his, Brady. He got it for his two year old birthday. Well, that's right. Um <laughs> so anyway, uh I was listening to these cassette tapes while I was playing free solitaire in my spare time. Um and uh, <laughs> I, uh, by the Classics. way, I graduated from Free Cell Solitaire. I'm now Candy Crush. That's Candy my Crush, thing. right? Yeah. Wow. I was going to say Minesweeper, <laughs> but that still would have been a little bit dated. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I've been all the way to the top of Candy Crush, but it's just hard up there. That's um, rough. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyhow. <laughs> Uh, what was I doing? I was listening to the cassettes and playing free cell. And so I spent a lot of hours just going through the whole Bible, listening to the Bible on tape, the international version. And um, somehow or other, just through that whole process, and of course, over the years, I'd noticed that there were discrepancies, there were problems, things didn't agree from here to there. And so, but listening to it like this, it all of a sudden it came home to roost. And I just said, you know what? Wait a minute. I can just say that this doesn't agree. I don't have to figure out how wow. it works together. Hmm. I can just say, Whoa, do, wait, James has a different idea than Paul does about salvation. Mm-hmm. My goodness. Okay. All right. So, so to, to be honest with you, once you unravel the Bible's authority, mm-hmm. however you do that, but once you just say, wait a minute, I don't think the Bible is this special inspired book of God, it all falls apart. Yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's the beginning of the end for a lot of people, for sure. Just recently, I've uh, been introduced to The History of God by Karen Armstrong, which talks about how... Um, she has a she has a theory with you know a lot of archaeologists and uh, people who've studied this that just kind of like the the evolution of where we got this idea of a monotheistic god that it started off polytheistic a lot of our bible was written and then it became um monotheistic around the time of isaiah um because you know isaiah was they think is written by two different guys there's Mm -hmm. isaiah one isaiah two isaiah two monotheistic went back rewrote a lot rewrote a lot of the bible um added genesis one which doesn't match up with With genesis Genesis two two. and um a lot of all these nice poem though and but you know i i I was listening to this and there was a um youtube video on it and it blew me away because it was like, you know, I've always felt that there was something so off about how all of, you know, the books, of the Old Testament, New Testament are put together. And um, I was talking to a friend about it and she said, yeah, I recently just came across this as well, just like within the last couple of weeks. And she said she talked to her friend who was going to seminary about it. And his only response was, yeah, it's very dangerous to question if the Bible has ever been edited or came from different sources. <laughs> and and that's the only like response that yeah. this Christian yeah. who is dedicating his entire life. And that's the best answer I could have given at that time yeah, yeah, sure. um, is, well, yeah, it's a bad idea to do that. Because, again, if you start picking at the, the yarn and the sweater, you're going to find yourself in the midriff very soon, you know? Yep. Yep. Exactly. Hmm. What other discrepancies do you remember? You said you mentioned James. Did, were there any other big ones that stuck out to your mind that just didn't click and didn't make sense? Well, I think the factual discrepancies between the Gospels and the stories about Jesus' life, and you know, just the things that don't agree there, um, stood out to me. Um, I don't. I don't remember too much off the top of my head besides that. Yeah. Yep. I was always weirded out by Satan hanging out with God in the beginning of Job. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah. What? Oh, Sat- Satan's what? a super interesting. Uh, I mean, Satan, Satan and Lucifer, not the same person in the Bible. Do tell. I'm interested. Uh, I'm intrigued. The well, I, it's not. They're not like we assume they're the same. That Lucifer fell from heaven, right? Mm-hmm. And we associate it with Satan. Just super, why? super weird that we don't know that story. The only reason we associate Lucifer with Satan is because John in the book of Revelation says that Satan was the one that fell from heaven. Uh, but there's no, uh, there's no other reason to believe that they're the same person. Hmm. And Satan is like, a, is like one of God's minions. In, in There's no indication that he's evil in Job whatsoever. He's just doing God's bidding. He's just, he just wants to stir some shit up. It's a su- it's super weird. And the in the uh the the lion that prowls about in the gospels is not necessarily Satan or <sighs> Lucifer. If those the two... evil one is not necessarily Satan or Lucifer, there's no reason to believe that any of those characters are related. We just somebody decided it one day. They need therapy. God and Satan put them in a room, work it out, work out your problems, quit getting everybody else involved. Dude, Satan is just doing whatever God asked him to do. That's true too. Ugh. Ugh. Satan. Uh, I remember one, that's right. I do remember one thing that um, influenced me at that time about discrepancies. And um, that is that I did a study of any verse in the Bible that was hell or Sheol or Gehenna or anything, mm. anything related to hell. And as you guys know, you find out that the idea of eternal punishment wasn't really there in the Old Testament. It came in the New yeah. Testament. And, you know, the biggest proponent of it in the New Testament is Jesus. Yep. So all, all of a sudden, right away, you're going, oh, wait, I thought Jesus was the one that made all this better. The Old Testament God was cranky, but Jesus came and made it all better. But wait a minute. Jesus is the guy teaching eternal punishment? Right. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, go ahead and pluck out your eye and throw it away in right. case you have to lust after somebody. Yeah. So you don't get – no, I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've – since Christianity and I've been with different religious groups and some of them will say, well, yeah, Jesus was an enlightened master. Oh yeah, well, I, you know, and I'm I'm yeah. like I don't think so. No, I don't know whatever that is supposed to be, but um, I'm not impressed. Yeah, hmm. a lot of people think he adopted a lot of Eastern philosophy from somewhere, some unknown source. But uh, but enlightened master, I would say, is a bit of a stretch when you're talking about hellfire all the time. Yeah, I'll pass. Yeah, for sure. This is. Uh, I'm just want to pause this for a second because this episode is so strangely parallel to the one we recorded last week. It's really weird. Well, just in the fact that like, it's okay. It's kind of freaking me out. So the, the guy that we interviewed last week, um, his name is Andrew. He went to... He went to Wheaton and, and Princeton. And Princeton. He, <laughs> he talked about, he criticized the passage about gouging your eye out and cutting he off did. your body parts. I forgot about that. He criti- He talked about the, uh, he, well, he talked about the polytheistic God. Um, Mm -hmm. becoming a a monotheistic god. But the weird thing is these episodes are so different. He talked about the hell developing during the Maccabean period. Oh, wow. You're right. This this is super weird. But it's not at all like, oh, this we're just repeating shit. No, no, like, this it is, is a com- different conversation. Completely different conversation. But, but you're right. There are a lot of coming up, yeah. and it's really freaking me out. Whoa. But you, hey, Chuck, Chuck, maybe you could edit them together and like, you know, he talks and then I talk to say, and then, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like a, yeah. a, a collage, a composite. It'll make a super person. Out it's, of a, you guys. it's a God thing, guys. Yeah, it's a God <laughs> thing. The Holy Spirit telling us not to listen <laughs> to him. Himself. Whatever told him that he's okay, however he is, is arranged. Is this, yeah, yeah, he's back. Okay, anyway. All right, and we're back. We should, yeah. Doug, um, I'm curious about, you had mentioned earlier that you're married. Um, has your wife deconstructed with you? No, she hasn't. Um, she attends a Methodist church in town. Okay. Um, and I think one of the things that has helped us last as a married couple is that um, she never was as fundamentalist as I was. She was raised a true Presbyterian, where I was this sort of hybrid Presbyterian. Her dad was a Presbyterian pastor, and he did not go into all of the Old Testament stuff and lay the guilt and all that um, on her. And so, um, yeah, so she's... um, 
she's still a, a believer, but um, we just have so much in common besides religion. Um, we're both musicians, and um, you know we enjoy the same sort of things for recreations and vacations, and we have our son and daughter-in-law and grandkids, and I mean, you know, and we enjoy each other's company. So yeah, we're happy to stay together. Cool. Uh, that's that's awesome. I'm glad that you had that. Um, the reason I'm asking is because I'm thinking of you know you deconstructing. You're saying that you really don't have any other like outputs or anybody else to like kind of talk to while you were doing this back at Wycliffe. Um, what was kind of going on when you were talking to her? I, was that was there kind of some tension there or some worrying about? Hey, this is what we're doing for our living. What are you gonna? How did how did that kind of all go down for you? Yeah, there were some tense times. Um, mm. I think she resented um, having to leave the mission because of me, you know, uh, because you, mm-hmm. you were either in as a couple or out as a couple. Right. So, you know, when I let them know that I didn't leave anymore, then we both had to leave. Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So that was, that was a tense time. I mean, now we're both grateful to be out of that whole cycle of having to go beg for your money Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and put out bulletins and newsletters, prayer letters that kind of give a glowing report of what's happening, you know, just be out of that whole thing. Right. Mm. Plus, plus be able to make a little more money than we did in the mission. Right, right, right. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, I think we're due for a break. Um, when we get back, we're going to talk to Doug a little bit about what he's up to now, what's different, um, what's better, what's worse. And Doug, when we get back, can I ask you some advice of like, because I know a lot of our listeners, we have a lot of married people and, um, it was hard for a lot of them where one person was deconstructing and not the other. A lot of couples like they deconstruct together, but, um, I want to kind of get a little bit of your advice if that's okay to our listeners of, um, how to kind of like balance that and everything like you have. So we'll be right back right after this. Yeah. Hey Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that, well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. (laughs) All right, you ready? We're rolling. Welcome back to the life after Brady Welcome Harden, Chuck Carson, and we're here with Chuck Doug. Carson, Brady Harden. Uh, oh, hey, uh, Doug. Before we left, um, I was asking you uh, for some, uh, asking you for marriage advice for some reason. <laughs> as, uh, as two single, yeah. as two unmarried people, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you guys, you're not, you're not going to propose right here on we, the show. No, it's not going to happen. No, <laughs> Brady. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Chuck. <laughs> Is it happening? Finally? Um, yeah, Doug, give us some marriage advice. We usually only allow divorcees on the show, but we're making an exception for you. Um, yeah, so what I would say, the main thing is, and this is just plain marriage advice, you know, for people, whether you're deconstructing or you're not deconstructing, you've just got to allow your partner to be what they are without wanting to change them. That's Yep. Yeah, you yeah. know, I think Definitely. W- with Sue and me, we've been married for, I don't know, it's like 40 years. And um, we, Impressive. I think I spent the first 20 trying to change her. Um, and then I gave up. And I think that maybe the same thing was happening the other mm-hmm. way. And finally, we like signed a peace treaty and said, all right, look, you can be you. I can be me. Because, um, you know, when you get married, you have an ideal of perfect person. And then the person you marry, they match some ways, but they don't match other ways. And you've just got to realize that that's the way it is. And you've got to let them be. Now where that comes into play, if you're deconstructing is when I first started deconstructing, I really wanted her to go on the journey with me. 
And, and I was putting yeah. pressure on her, you know, to go on the journey with me. And I think I had this idea that um, the only way that we could have a perfect union or something like that is if we had agreement in this area. And I finally decided, no, you know what? This isn't working. It's not good. Um, mm. I just need to let her be where she is. And if she never changes, that's fine. Do you that's think awesome. that her not being as like dogmatic or fundamentalist uh, plays into that? Or do you think that... Because I think that if she was more dogmatic, there's a possibility that she may not want to stay with somebody who's not a Christian, but it doesn't sound like that's her attitude. I think that is outlook. absolutely true. That plays into it a big factor. The other factor is that our son was grown. We didn't have any children at home that we had to argue about how they were going to be raised. Mm. Um, yeah, so both of those right. things, I think, played into what made it easy. I totally understand how it doesn't work for some people to stay together when— um, you know, when this happens, yeah, that's cool. I'm glad you guys were able to stay together and find peace and, you know, just kind of, I, I'm always fascinated by fundamentalists who are, who are okay and at peace with people who are not Christians, uh, that close in their life, because like you'd mentioned before, we were kind of brainwashed to, to feel as if, we didn't have anything in common with those people. We didn't have the ability to, we weren't on the same level as them morally or whatever. Um, but I, I love the fact that you guys have so much more that your marriage is built on, that it wasn't just religion or serving God together. Um, Cause being a missionary couple, you would almost assume that that would be the case. Um, but I don't know. I think that's great that, there was more to it than that. I like know? that the same concept that led you out of the faith is the concept that, that helped preserve your marriage, right? Like you are okay as you are, like you're good, you know? Oh damn, you're right. Right. Like, ex like accepting, applying that to your, to your spouse seems to have. Shit. Yeah. Uh, Cause that voice was like, Doug, you are who you are. And yeah. the second voice was, she is who she is. <laughs> that was the second voice. Yeah. Fuck. That was good. And, and the third one. voice and the hardest voice to listen to is the voice that says, Donald is what Donald is. I am referring uh, to Are you Trump. referring to Trump? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to say, I'm like, I thought yeah, about, that's, like, that's wait, the his third, name's Doug. That's the third, yeah, no, for a second <laughs> I was like, wait, Donald, <laughs> Doug, <laughs> Doug, okay. No, okay, he's talking about Donald Trump, yes, yeah. <laughs> Donald is who Donald, yeah, well, okay, that's yeah, a, that's a whole, episode. that's another episode. I do not want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but that does actually lead me to um, something that I wanted to ask you about is that you said um, sort of in your in your in your pre interview uh, stuff that you sent us um, that you when you first deconverted, you were uh, you were angry about it and you were out trying to be uh, trying to be trying to, you know, help everybody else out. And you were angry about your experience and the guilt and the fear that you felt. Um, and you don't feel as angry anymore. And that's something that we're, we're trying to kind of zero in on, on this show, this, this season is that it's totally okay to be angry mm -hmm. about your experience as a Christian and you should be, and that's, that's fair and very valid, but, uh, we, we don't we don't want to stay there. Mm, that's what you say. I'm more of a stay there person, but, um, <laughs> no, don't kid, you feel that way sometimes? I mean, don't you go back and forth between, between, oh, yeah. you know, one day you're, 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 you're like, yeah, I understand they're brainwashed. I get it. You know, and the next yep. day you're like, yep. I had this, well, I digress, but I go back and I go, I go, <laughs> no, I yeah. no, I totally agree. I mean, I I go back and forth yeah. all the I had time. Yeah, something today, and um, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, one of the beautiful things about being in this place of not being a Christian is that your heart can be open to all people, and and you can be you can be friends mm, with any yes any kind of person that is out there, even Brady, you know, for instance. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just, From the, I'm that just extreme kidding. end of the it's spectrum. Right. 
<laughs> it's rough. I'm just kidding. So, uh, but you can be you can be friends with anybody, and you don't have to make categories mm. of people. Um, you know, they're just people. Everybody's mm-hmm. a people. Mm-hmm. We've been saying a lot on the show. You know, indoctrinated people indoctrinate people, and so it's kind of like this perpetuation that they are creating what they made themselves. And then those people do the same thing over and over and over. And you, and you can't be mad at a, at an individual who's a cog in that machine um, outside of what things that they participated in specifically that are obviously wrong. You know, right, right. there's obviously limitations, but um, yeah, people repeat what they believe and they create other people to believe what they believe right. and to continue. It's just, Ooh, I mean, it's like you were saying, like there, you know, you un you unraveled the the hell thread, but it was it was another fourteen fifteen years before you unraveled all the other threads, you know. Mm. And it's it's how it was for me. I mean, it you know, it was years and years of deconstruction. If I really go back to where I started doubting things, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. Is 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 seeing indoctrinated people as people who are indoctrinated and, and not as um, necessarily as uh, as perpetrators, you know? I wish I could have a graph that went, like, showed my level of dogma right along the same, like, right along, like, uh, beside another graph that has my level of doubts. Because uh-huh. I would love to see... I, I feel like when I would start having some doubts on things is when I became a lot more dogmatic and there was kind of oh, like a back yeah. and forth sort of cycle to that. Dogma for goes me. down, uh, doubt shoot up. A downward dogma. Dogma. Downward dogma. <laughs> downward dogma. Um, so Doug, um, you, uh, you also talked a little bit about um, like, you, so you were, uh, you were angry about the guilt and fear that you were experiencing as a Christian or that you had experienced looking back in hindsight, realizing like, Oh, I was, I was terribly guilty and terribly afraid over literally nothing. Hmm. And you were angry about that, but then you, you sort of realized that like the, the anger and guilt that you experienced as a result of religion was just a small fraction of, of the, the sort of psychological heaviness that you had as a person. There's, there's, there's other work to do, right? Because, when you first deconvert and you get rid of the fear of hell and the other fears that you you have, um, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to be totally free now. Um, and but mm-hmm. then years later, I see, you know, wait, I still have a lot of other fears, and it's not even related to God. Or, I mean, maybe some of it's related because maybe somehow internally I'm trying to live up to some standard. I don't know, but but for whatever sure. yeah. whatever reason, it seems that there's still a lot of fear going around. Yeah, I mean, I I uh, actually just the past couple of months for me, probably month, uh, has been sort of a painful realization for me that I have a lot of like leaving religion did not fix all of my problems as a human. Mm, Right. It was a big step. Like it was very necessary. Lots of, I would say probably way more than 10% of my guilt and shame came, came from it probably 60, 70%, but I still carry around shame. I still carry around guilt for other things, for complexes that I've invented. Um, and, and just being a part of the world, being a part of American culture, um, and all of that stuff, it sort of, sort of adds together. So, um, mm. you know, I, leaving religion is, is, a, is big and important and, and huge, but it's not, it's not the only, fix-all. it's not the mm. only, it's not the only part of it. And that's why we're so big on go see a counselor, find a counselor that you like, therapy, develop a relationship, yes. get therapy, uh, talk yes. through your shit and start un- unraveling those layers of of uh of complexes that we build up you know and self-improvement books are so helpful yeah um so many things doug i have another question because you came from a background of ministry that where that was your livelihood that was your plan for so many years um you found yourself after 17 years needing a job that did not involve Bible translations um, or, you know, the ministry or minis- uh, missions. Obviously, you're doing computer stuff. So I'm, 
is that what you use to kind of jump into your, your next chapter in life or how was that transition? Cause I know so many of our listeners used to be pastors or people like me. And then, uh, we realized that, Oh, um, <laughs> atheists with a Bible degree don't do anything with their Bible degree. So what's I'm the next step? I'm just thinking a resume, you know, <laughs> atheist, <laughs> Bible yeah. degree. Um, I don't know what else you have, but anyway, yep. well, for me, I actually benefited from the training I got in the missions because when we decided or it was decided for us not to become translators, the mission gave us vocational mm-hmm. tests and they said, oh, we think you would do good in computers. I hadn't done any work in computers up till then. I was actually kind of against doing it. Um, I was sort of into nature at that point and didn't want like electronic stuff and um, whatever. But uh, but I did, gotcha. I did go into it. I'm grateful now because by the time we left the mission, that gave me the ability to get a job on the outside. So I had a skill. Gotcha. I mean, you kind of lucked out. That's I did. Awesome. I did. That's I lucked out. Happy. Yeah. Cool. How do you feel about Wycliffe and missions and everything now on this side of it? Um, looking back at your experience and what they do. Um, how do you feel about that? Wycliffe has a lot of quality people. Um, I think that in terms of missions, um, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to make comparisons. But the thing is that what they're doing is not incredibly effective as near as I could tell. Um, because the idea was, as I mentioned, that you were supposed to translate the Bible, and then people would automatically get converted just from translating the Bible. Didn't mm-hmm. seem to be happening most of the time. Most of the time when we would have a translation dedication, a newsletter go out, um, one of the items on that newsletter would be pray that this translation will get used. Um, mm. Oh, wow. That was more often than not. There were a lot of reasons for that. When you get over there and you see that in a minority language culture situation, Economically, it's really advantageous for the young people, especially, to learn the broader language of the area. That's what they call the trade language, the language that commerce is done in. Um, And, of course, English is the trade language of the world. Mm -hmm. So it's an advantage for, for young people in third world situations to learn English or to learn the broader trade language. And so the focus on the their language of the home is not that not that great but in any case we uh we really got the impression that most of the translations were not being used by by people and they were not actually converting people Mm -hmm. Uh, there were no good numbers that i ever saw but it just it felt that way from what what was happening and um once in a while you would get a story that was uh positive and we'd all put that one in our newsletters Mm -hmm. um Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but the great thing about Wycliffe is that we had a product that we could report on. We could report and say, oh, five translations were done in the last three months. Right. And that works in American evangelical culture, you know, that sure. because actually, wow. even if nobody gets saved, we're, uh, we're ticking down the languages until Jesus comes again. Right. 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 Mm. We're Interesting. Getting, we're getting yeah. the gospel into all the world. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. I mean, I remember, yeah, I remember hearing from, from Wycliffe, uh, probably at my high school, um, and being like, yeah, that's the, that's the real shit, man. They're like out there, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> like being really convinced by, but, uh, yeah, it's not necessarily, it doesn't mean it's effective. They don't have to talk about that though. How, how would that process work though? Um, they would find kind of like a small people group, uh, spend time with them, get to know the language, and then they would translate, I'm assuming like a, start off with a, one of the gospels or what was the process? Right. Um, so the Philippines had about 80 languages. And um, so, you know, maybe I, I, I would say maybe when they started out, maybe 20 of them had translations. I don't know. But the other 60 or whichever did not have any Bible in that language, um, then somebody from the mission would go, usually a couple would go live with the people or a family would go live with the people and, um, 
Learn the language, yes, learn the language. And, and we had to be trained in linguistics so that we could create a dictionary for this language. There was a lot of linguistic work that goes into it. You create a dictionary, you create a grammar, you write down the grammatical rules for this language. Mm -hmm. um, and all that is foundational before you ever start the translation process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once you start the process, you get a translation helper who works with you, native language speaker, and you go through verse by verse. And then they have all these levels of checking where they check the translation to make sure it's accurate, make sure it um, expresses it properly in the language. So it's a long process, mm -hmm. very long process, usually at least 10 years. Wow. You know, oh, that's a long time. So and yeah. And then they finally get it in their language, and then they read it a couple of times, and they think, gosh, I can't believe in hell anymore. This would make good toilet paper. <laughs> Chuck. Well, you know, Chuck, it's, it's, funny, it's funny you should say that, because there were stories that that uh -huh. happened, you know, uh -huh. uh, that uh -huh. that happened, yeah. I, I wouldn't even... Is that the most offensive thing I've ever said on this show, Brady? Earlier today, I was thinking if I'm ever <laughs> if I'm ever in prison, um, I wouldn't feel bad using the Bible if I needed to, or if I was like in a, in a survival uh -huh. setting. I got plenty of I got um, like four thousand sheets. Two thousand. You want to do at least two ply, buddy? Those, it depends are, on which one, man. That's quality paper. Anyway, <laughs> uh, can we it's think? Not, of, is there anything else we want to? It's not very. Oh, sorry, it's not very absorbent. <laughs> <laughs> That's very. Neither true. am I. Uh, Doug, we want to thank you very much for coming on to the show today. Um, you you mentioned earlier that you and your wife are a musician, and you you sent us a song, right? Can you give us the background of this song? Because we're going to play it um, after our outro. So, listeners, stay tuned to hear Doug's song. Tell us about the song, Doug. Sure. So when. Uh, Sue and I were in the Philippines uh, in 1999. There was a lot of time on my hands. That was the time when I was listening to the Bible on cassette so much. And I was playing a lot of guitar. There was no TV. There was no entertainment of what it, any kind. And um, Well, free sell. Yeah, 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 yeah. Free, free sell. <laughs> free sell along with... Right. I forgot that. How could I forget that? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we had National Geographic's in the library. Um, ah. But in, in any case, so I was uh, having all these doubts and it just came to a head. And I, I wrote this song and the song just kind of erupted out of me. It was I couldn't mm -hmm. sing it any other way than at <laughs> full volume. And mm -hmm. the Green family lived next door to us. And I know they heard me, and I wondered what they thought about me singing mm -hmm. this song that I don't buy it anymore. I don't buy this fucking bullshit anymore. Those mm -hmm. aren't the exact words, but um, <laughs> yes, that song was the expression of my decision to not be a Christian. Well, hey, Doug, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show today, uh, and we're going to hear your song right after this. I'm almost expecting like a hard, like heavy metal song, where it's just like him screaming at the top of his lungs saying, I don't buy this fucking bullshit. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, it's I think been a while somebody, since I've listened to it. I think somebody, I think it could be done heavy metal. I'm, I, I don't we're know gonna... how to do that, but somebody could do the song heavy metal. I'm on it. On <laughs> That's going to be our new intro music. On the next Life After. <laughs> Life of fucking shit. Um, uh, also, hey, we want to remind our listeners too, um, we have a secret Facebook group for people who are deconstructing their faith. Doug, yep. you're part of that, right? Yes, absolutely. I'll enjoy I, the group. I, I knew you cool. were. I was just playing stupid. Um, so if that is something that you're interested in joining, uh, find us on Facebook. We have uh, three questions that we'll ask you to make sure that you do belong in the group just to protect everybody. Um, yeah, who's inside it is. The group. It's completely uh, private. It, no, Nobody can see who's in the group from the outside, so you don't have to worry about uh, you know, unsafe family members or church, church members or people from your life that are going to harass you about leaving the faith. Yep. And um, also, please remember to uh, find us on iTunes, rate and review. And uh, and also Patreon. Hey. Patreon. Give us money. Patreon. 
<laughs> uh, so we will uh, end with uh, Doug's song. And remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second Saturday. When I was a child, I went to Sunday school. They taught me all about the golden rule. They said that if I pray a prayer, I'd go to heaven. But if not, I'd go to hell. But I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. I've got to deny it. Cause I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. It's just not fair. They say that God is love and that he cares for us. He wants us happy and prosperous. But if we don't believe that Jesus is his son, then he'll send us straight to hell. But I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. I've got to deny it. Cause I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. No, I don't buy it. It's just not fair.